don't waste your time trying to hire people that don't align with the vision. Like you can't force people to have vision. Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Today, we're diving into the fascinating intersection of martial arts and entrepreneurship with Stephen Webster, a true renaissance man in the world of technology and sports. Stephen is the CEO and founder of Asensei, a groundbreaking company using motion capture and human movement recognition to revolutionize connected health and fitness. As somebody that is in this space, I find what he is doing fascinating, and I'm excited for you to learn more about his technology. With multiple black belts and a track record of building winning teams in the dojo and in the business world, Stephen brings a unique perspective on leadership, innovation, and the art of building successful organizations. From his early days as a martial arts instructor to his roles at tech giants like Adobe and Microsoft, Stephen has consistently pushed boundaries and redefined what is possible. And this is one of my favorite things about doing this show is I get to meet people that have very unique skill sets. And it is just absolutely fascinating to really dig into these people's lives and learn from them, kind of sit at their feet. And that is one of the great things about today's episode is you're going to meet truly one of the most unique people I've met so far. Today, we'll discuss why being the smartest person in the room might actually be holding you and your organization back and how asking the right questions could be more powerful than having all the answers. I know it's something that a lot of us struggle with. Stephen's about to reveal why the traditional playbook for leadership and innovation might be outdated and what you should be doing instead. So let's get right to it. Let's lean in and learn from the best. Stephen, I would consider you a rare breed of entrepreneur, rebel, I would put excellent communicator in there because not every entrepreneur is a very good communicator. What have you learned in your career and in martial arts more specifically that has helped you become a successful entrepreneur? First of all, it's great to be on the show. Thanks for having me. What have I learned? I am a big believer in the importance of tradition, but not being stuck in it. So you kind of first have to learn from tradition, right? So in martial arts, a great example, you don't just walk in the dojo and like, I don't care how this gets taught. I'm going to do it my way. First of all, you probably don't get back to the next class. <laughs> right. But it's also just not the way to learn. But there is a principle, it's kind of codified in martial arts called shuhari, um, which is to first learn from tradition, then to break from tradition before transcending the tradition. And it's kind of, It's about the journey to mastery or the journey of learning. And the two things are kind of the same, right? And so that served me well. You know, in martial arts, I spent many, many years, probably a black belt in jiu-jitsu or maybe even a second degree black belt in jiu-jitsu and a second degree black belt in karate, Mm. just doing what I was told. Like, this is how to do it. This is how this throw is performed. This is how this, you know, whatever. And then as I started to teach... A little bit of the flavor of you goes into it, right? You know, I maybe move a little differently or I've maybe been, I've done jiu-jitsu, but I also did a little Tai Chi with someone or also did a little Salat, Indonesian Salat Mm -hmm. with someone. And and so you start to bring things in. And so now you're kind of seasoning the dish a little differently to how it was taught. We were just talking about culinary school, right? And then ultimately people come along and they see you as a coach and they're like, he's the only person that teaches that like that. And that's where you go to learn that, right? And I feel the same about building a business is you don't just walk into an industry and say, I know better than everybody else. Uh, You're all doing it wrong and I'm going to do it right. Or you could, but you're probably not going to get as much traction as if you show up with some of that same humility that you show up in the dojo with, which is, you know, I'm going to listen and I'm going to be curious and I might be forming opinions. I'll hold them loosely, but I might come back to them. And then eventually you're pacing for a while and you're walking at the same pace as everyone, but eventually you earn the right to kind of start to veer off in a slightly different direction. And lo and behold, people are following you. You know, you're not outpacing them, you're redirecting them. And I think that's worked very well for me multiple times in my career where I have a very unconventional or unorthodox point of view on what the future should look like and how we get there, but I don't burst into the middle of the room and scream about it. 
I spend a little bit more time. I'd like to think being humble and curious. Did you ever make the mistake of not doing that? Yes. <laughs> so is that why you now follow this? Was there some pain involved in that? I mean, I, I, you know, I can think about it both in martial arts and in business. You know, in martial arts, you know, when I first started, uh, so I taught at the University of Edinburgh. I competed for the club as a student. I captained the club. I was an assistant coach as a student. And then I was asked by the university to teach the club full time. When I graduated, I taught the club for like 10 years. And I was young. Yeah, you know, like I was in my 20s. And maybe I should just draw a line there. <laughs> you know, you know where this story is going. But uh, yeah, I was probably just a little bit too much to prove, right? I kind of felt that pressure of I need to prove myself. And it probably showed up. I don't want to say with arrogance, but I was definitely swimming in a different direction to everyone else. So people would be like, that's not karate. They're not doing karate or that's not allowed or that's not the way you should train. And maybe rubbing people up the wrong way is uh, a better way of putting it. People were uncomfortable with the unorthodoxy. Hmm. I don't think I've showed up in a work environment quite as brash as that. But um, I did have one boss who would always just be like, why do you have to be the smartest guy in the room? Like, why do you have to... I was like, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I'm right. And why would I sit quiet? <laughs> <laughs> and again, I think just, you know, the wisdom of experience you learn. If you want to lead people, you can't, you don't lead them like this. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of walk alongside them and change their trajectory. So yes. I mean, you've been an innovator in tech. And so there is a balance of seeing things that other people don't see, a future that doesn't exist. And then when people tell you you're crazy, you just keep moving forward. I just did a podcast with uh, one of the co-founders of a company called Pendulum Therapeutics. Mm. And they're a venture-backed company that's been around for a decade. Their products has only just started showing up on the market. They create probiotics that you, you can't get anywhere else because they're not like readily available in the environment. And so there was a lot. This is a biotech company, essentially. Mm. And these are very, very smart people. And Colleen was telling me that when she uh, went up, they that that oh, you know, she's a PhD from Johns Hopkins, and her group's like really smart. And they're like, when they went out to raise venture capital, they thought they would the money would come, and it just did not happen. This is a very familiar story. <laughs> and it was like a year of like banging their head against a wall, and they started with thirty thousand dollars, and then they got a little bit of money. And then the first person to actually write them a check was Mayo, but it wasn't like a huge chunk. They didn't even realize how significant they didn't get venture capital, I think, for several years into this thing. And this is a biotech company. That's biotech companies will, I mean, VCs will put $100 million or $50 million right. into seeding it, knowing that they're not going to see anything for a while. So, as an entrepreneur, how do you develop the tenacity to keep pushing forward? under extreme situations and uncertainty so part of it is just fall seven times get up eight right hmm. you have to be comfortable with discomfort right? you have to recognize that it is going to be hard it is going to be unjust it is going to be unfair you are going to be the smartest person in the room around the subject that you care about and have to hear someone else who doesn't know what you know tell you why you're wrong and there's humility about that. So I think, you know, there is just, quite honestly, you need to be prepared to put in the reps. And, you know, sport and martial arts teaches you that. Just you got to mm -hmm. get the reps in. So that's the easy, hard answer. But I think the two other things I would share, one is one of the strongest muscles you can develop as an entrepreneur, not even as an entrepreneur, even as an intrapreneur inside of a company. I've worked inside of companies like Adobe and Microsoft where my teams have been very entrepreneurial in the sense of, like we're trying to do something different and trying to take the company in a different direction. The best muscle to develop is the muscle of storytelling. You have to be able to craft a narrative. And if you study the archetypes of a good story, whether it's the hero's journey or whatnot, you know, there's a way to think about telling your story that isn't just like 10 slides that get to an ask for money or get to an ask for a resource. The third point I was going to make, which is very related, and I learned this relatively recently, probably about 10 years ago, there was a book I read called A Beautiful Question. And it was about the power of inquiry. And the idea, and I tried to do this a lot, I shouldn't give this away, this is a good one, but I tried <laughs> to do this a lot, is uh, 
ask people, imagine if, or what if. So my company, just very quickly, Ascensi, we are a movement recognition technology. We allow a computer with a camera or a smartphone with a camera to recognize what sport you're playing or exercise you're doing and understand it and coach you on it. So I could explain it to you as boring as that, or I could ask a beautiful question. What if a machine could understand human movement? What would that unlock? What would be possible? And so suddenly you've turned it into a quest. There's that kind of famous letter of mm. uh, Shackleton, you know, who wants to come to the ice pole with me? You know, you'll probably die. You'll probably freeze to death. But if you don't, glory awaits, you know, it's like, <laughs> and it's like, sign me up. That sounds amazing <laughs> because you framed the quest. You framed the challenge that the possibility of the successful outcome is way, way greater than it takes you out of that mindset of all the reasons it won't work and puts you into the mindset of, I want to help make that work. And so whether you're hiring a team or whether you're trying to win a customer uh, who's like a first of framing these beautiful questions as what if or imagine if, they fill in the blanks and get to yes by themselves. Mm. So that's something I think about a lot. That's great. I think that disarms people a little bit too because it starts getting them curious right especially if you're asking for something right ultimately like you're asking them to buy or to purchase right. or to invest or whatever and when they can start getting curious and start seeing a, an alternative future they haven't thought about probably opens them up to all sorts of options that you would like well you give someone a post-it note and a sharpie and ask them to stick an answer on the wall and they'll tell you the reason they want to buy Mm. It's as straightforward as that. We all love to be problem solvers. Like another great framing is, I wonder if you could help me. Very few of us don't like to say yes to, can you help me? Like generally, most people have a innate desire to be helpful if they can help. And so I wonder if you could help me think about X is a really great way of just leading someone into possibility as opposed to, again, all the reasons why something wouldn't work. If you're enjoying today's episode, please do me a favor, hit that follow or subscribe button on whichever listening platform you are joining us from. And if you love the show, if you really love the blueprint, please leave us a rating and written review as that goes a long way in helping us grow the show. So you said that you've worked on some pretty entrepreneurial teams. I think the one at Adobe, weren't you acquired by Adobe? Yeah, my first company, company started in Scotland. We were a software consultancy, and yeah, we were acquired by Adobe. So when you get acquired by somebody, typically this is an entrepreneurial group stuck inside a bureaucratic organization. And I'm not saying that's Adobe. Yeah. And then you earn your buyout and you're gone. What was it like kind of, I have no idea. Adobe's a creative organization, but so are a lot of these other places that people go to. What was that like? You go from being the leader, the king, rallying the troops, getting everybody going, and then you're acquired, which is great. And now you're inside of a, you're a part of a big machine. I'm just curious, what was that like? So my experience was amazing. It was probably the highlight of my career other than what I do today. We knew the team there very well. Technically, we were acquired by Macromedia as Macromedia was at the same time being acquired by Adobe. I think that's because Macromedia had a Dublin office and tax. But anyway, so we knew the team there very well. We were actually partners with them. We were a consulting firm, mm -hmm. consulting around technologies that Adobe was saw the future in, in enterprise software. And so we knew people inside the company very well. We were very well regarded. We knew them from the, the conference circuit. They involved us in product roadmap. And so it was very humbling. Again, I'm using that word humble again. But it was very humbling of like, wow, we think you guys are awesome and you think we're good enough to be part of like this future mm -hmm. from the inside. And then the other thing that happened is my company became the nucleus of what's now like a thousand plus person consulting organization inside of Adobe. But they were like, we like the way you guys consult. We like the way you go to market. We like, it's not heretical now, but it was heretical at the time that enterprise software would have UX design and software. You know, We used to not care how bad software was that we used at work. We only cared about how nice software was that we paid for. And then there was this consumerization of IT where if the software we were using at work sucked, we didn't want to use it and we found something else ourselves to use, right? Mm. And so what was fantastic for me inside of Adobe is I got to build something from the ground up inside of Adobe with the resource of Adobe. But more importantly, 
I was just surrounded by a bunch of way more seasoned people, people who were closer to the end of their career than the beginning of their career, who were like mentors to me and kind of saw potential in me and saw potential in my team and took me under their wing. And they were like, you should be thinking about this role in the company, not this role in the company. And this is what you would need to do to get there. And this is the exposure you need. And so I learned sales and I learned marketing and I learned so many other things that an engineer hadn't ever been really exposed to before. So it was a wonderful experience. And uh, some of my dearest friends are from Adobe or still at Adobe. And I consider that like a really um, flourishing part of my career. It kind of unlocked more of my potential. Where is Adobe located, by the way? Headquarters is San Jose, so Bay Area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you've developed some successful teams. What's the key to developing a great team that then creates great products or has great outcomes that serves people in a, an extraordinary way? It's funny. I learned to build teams in the dojo. I uh, took over a club, as I said, I took over coaching the karate club. And to be honest, the club was on its knees. We sucked. We were small. We hadn't competed in competitions for a few years. And it was kind of a like, take the club over and see if you can turn it around. And we became, I took the club to one, two weeks later from taking over the club, I said, let's go to the national championships. We're not going to be very good, but we're going to learn what it looks like. And we're going to go back next year and we're going to win it. And that's literally what we did. We went back, we got our asses handed to us. We were not very good at all. But I managed to get everyone fired up about, again, imagine if, you know, I don't think I was mm. as intentional as a 20 something, but like, imagine if we come back here next year and we win it because we trained for it and we did win it. And so then I told the club, let's win three. And when we won three and again, the folly of youth, I was like, let's win 10. And then I had to, <laughs> so but we won 10 consecutive national championships. Wow. And, you know, I think what I learned there translates to how I've always thought about building teams, whether that's building a team inside of Adobe or building a company, which is first, it needs to be a quest. There needs to be a golden fleece at the end. There needs to be a from to. Like, we're here today, but what if we could move from here to this? You know, so I think it's fundamental to leadership is that there's a vision, mm. but it's a vision that everybody kind of feels like they're part of. It's a quest for them. And then I think the second thing I would share is don't waste your time trying to hire people that don't align with the vision. Like you can't force people to have vision. There's plenty of people, if it's a good idea, <laughs> and if you're a good storyteller, you'll find the people who kind of like feel it. And especially for an early stage company or a, even a, an incubated business inside of an organization, like people are going to have to really want to do this because it's hard. And so... I could probably think of 20 things here, but those are the big ones for me. Is no, nah, it's easy. Really clear vision. Have a really clear vision <laughs> and surround yourself with people that share that vision with you and go together. It's always way harder than you anticipate. <laughs> and I mean, when I started what I'm doing right now, I had no clue how hard it would be. Right. It's interesting in sports. I've been a part of some big turnarounds where like the team was in the dumps and then we went all the way to a championship. Right. And people are like business and sports are very similar. I'm like, yes, and absolutely not. Yes. In the sense that talent is important. Talent wins for yeah. sure. Culture resources, all these things. What's different is, is like in sports, you step in with a budget, a building and a place to begin with. In business, you have nothing right. and you have to make, it's like pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Unless you are one of the few that gets seated by your second time founder and Sequoia writes you a $5 million check to get yeah. started. But even then there's it's it nothing, yeah. nothing. Yeah. So it's always a lot harder than we anticipate it being. And I think that you've been successful several times. What do you think is the commonality of that success? I think it's different every time, you know, because it really, I mean, I think you said the key thing, a lot of it comes down to the resource around you and the resource available to you. Yeah. I also like that mindset. I think I learned it from NLP, which I know a lot of people frown on, but you know, neuro linguistic programming, which is yeah, you have to realize that you have all the resources available to you or the ability to harness them, you know, that kind of idea of self-efficacy. And so I think that's an important mindset. 
whether you're inside of a billion dollar company and you've been given headcount for 30 people and kind of you have a checkbook or whether you're a startup, mm-hmm. you have to recognize that I have all the resources available to me and the ability to harness them. Now, as a bootstrap startup, your ability to harness them might be like, hey, could you do me a favor project and I'll maybe give you some equity in the company? Or I'll, you, So you might mm-hmm. have to think differently about how you're going to provide an incentive structure, but you know where the resources that can help solve the problem that you're facing. I did a brief stint, like three, four years at Microsoft in between Adobe and my company, Ascensi, that I'm with now. And stepping into Ascensi, I mean, you kind of framed it right. I'm like, yeah, I sold my company to Adobe. I've got Adobe on my resume and Microsoft on my resume. And I'll just drive down to Palo Alto one day and walk along Sand Hill Road and I'll get funded. And then I'll figure out what I'm going to do with $2 million and I'll hire people. And yeah, to your point, same as your biotech example, couldn't get a check. You know, the first four years were no money or 25 grand at a time. The bank never looked like it was going to last for very long. And we were just having to be really resourceful and scrappy. But the thing I found hardest was seven years at Adobe, three years at Microsoft, I got really comfortable having a comms team and a marketing team and a sales team and an ops team. And and suddenly it's like, I got to do all this stuff by myself. So I think the other thing is the early nucleus of a team they have to be doers, not thinkers. You know, they have to be people that can just like my CTO has still probably written more lines of code on our product than anyone else in the company. He's not CTO to just stand at a whiteboard and tell everyone how to do their job. If you enjoyed today's episode, we have one more coming your way with Stephen. We're going to discuss the power of great questions, why Elon Musk reads biographies and how if you're looking for a breakthrough, you may need to look to the past. Until next time, stay curious, stay consistent, and keep chasing excellence.